The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book One On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness Chapter Eight Two Thrown Stones Faster, Janner! Tink yelled over his shoulder as he sprinted toward town. Janner was huffing behind him, unable to keep up. As they passed the livery at the edge of town, Janner heard a deeper sound. Below Lily's screams and Nugget's growls, the dreadful, unmistakable hiss and snarl of a fang. Janner looked from one side of the street to the other, desperate for some clue as to where the screams were coming from. But they seemed to be everywhere. Tink bolted down the main street, which was mostly deserted. The few adults who remained were hustling towards the cliffs, thinking only of the annual dance of the sea dragons. If they heard the screams and the growling at all, they showed no sign of it. Out of the corner of Tink's eye, down a narrow alleyway between Farina's flower shop and Jaybird's barber shop, he saw a fang struggling with something. Tink skidded to a stop and Janner plowed into him, nearly knocking him down. There in the alley, in a cloud of dust, Nugget was darting back and forth between the fang's legs, evading the fang's furious efforts to stab him with a spear. Lily screamed again, and without a second thought, her brothers ran down the alley to save her though they both knew there was nothing two young boys could do, pitted against a fang of dang. The narrow alley led around a corner to a small area between the back of Farina's and her stables. Lily was curled into a ball while a second fang held her in place with the butt of his spear. One fang watched with grim delight as the other struggled with the little black dog. Nugget was in a frenzy, pouncing in and out, snarling and snapping at the fang. The fang standing over Lily was chuckling in a thin, papery voice. What's the matter, Slarb? Is the smelly little thing too much for you? Slarb growled as he jabbed again at Nugget. The spear nicked Nugget in the leg and he yelped. Lily screamed and the fang, fang jabbed at her with the butt of his spear just as her brothers burst around the corner. Tink in the lead. Lily saw them and began kicking at the fang with renewed vigor. Janner found himself on Slarb's back, beating him with all his might around the neck and the shoulders. It was the first time he had ever touched a fang, and he was dimly surprised how cold the scaly skin was. Tink dove past the second fang, grabbed Lily's arms, and tried to pull her away from it. Slarb, with Janner on his back, hissed and thrashed, his long, sharp fangs dripping with venom that burned at the touch. Nugget bit the lizard's leg and wouldn't let go. The other fang seized Tink by the shirt collar and yanked him backward to the ground, where he lay choking and clutching his throat. Lily reached for her clutch, but the fang snatched it away from her and crushed it into splinters. She saw bits of wood etched with purple flowers flying through the air. The fang then strode over to Slarb and kicked Nugget hard in the belly, sending him flying through the air with a yelp. The little dog crashed into the wooden wall and landed in a motionless heap. Slarb hurled Janner over his shoulder and onto the ground. He bent over Janner's neck with his scaly jaw wide open, baring his dripping fangs to bite. The second fang drew his sword and raised it to strike Tink. Lily was helpless but to close her eyes and pray. At that moment there was a dull thunk. Slarb's black eyes rolled back and he fell unconscious on top of Janner. The second fang had time to see that Slarb had been hit in the head with a fist-sized rock before he felt a stone smash into his own temple. He tottered for a moment, then crumpled to the dirt. Tink lay there stunned. Where did those rocks come from? He asked between gasps of air. Lily's hands were folded tight, and her eyes were still shut. She opened one of her eyes, amazed that the three of them were still alive. They heard Janner's muffled voice from beneath the fang, and Tink snapped out of his daze. After a few heaves, he pushed Slarb off, and Janner scrambled away with a moan, wiping his neck where the fang's burning venom had dripped on it. Janner rushed over to Lily and helped her up, inspecting her carefully. Are you hurt? Lily trembled but shook her head, pushing her hair from her face. She hugged her brothers and smiled through stubborn tears. Nugget, she cried and hobbled over to the little black heap. We should get out of here, Janner said. We don't want to be here when these things wake up. One of the fangs groaned and stirred. Lily was crying, stroking Nugget's face. Lily, we have to go, Janner urged, pulling her away from the dog. Suddenly, Nugget yelped and leapt to his feet. 
Hackles raised, he bared his teeth and circled menacingly. But his fierceness melted when he saw Lily, and he set to licking her face and wagging his tail as if nothing had happened. Lily struggled to her feet and pointed to her ruined crutch. I won't be going anywhere with that. Here, Janner said, sidling up beside her and pulling one of her arms around his neck. It looks like you're going to have to let us help you for once. Let's go, he said, and they hurried out of the alleyway, leaving it completely empty. Except, of course, for the two fangs lying in the dirt, the two stones that knocked them unconscious, and the mysterious figure on the roof of J. Bird's barbershop watching the three Igby children flee. Chapter 9 The Glipper Trail When they were back in the open street, two of the three children and Nugget felt a little better. Lily was mostly happy that Nugget was fine, Tink was mostly glad that Lily was fine, and Janner was mostly terrified because he was the oldest and had begun to think of the future. He knew Glipwood was a small town, and it would only be a matter of time, maybe hours, maybe just minutes, before the fang called Slarb and his companion reported back to Commander Norm. Then terrible things would follow. We have to go home. Ah, Janner, Tink wailed, already on to the next adventure. Can't we see the dragons? Everyone's there, and as soon as the moon rises... By the time the moon rises, you know what's going to happen? Janner said hotly. Lily and Tink were silent as they made their way through Glipwood's empty main street. Janner tried to calm himself down. What's going to happen, other than the sea dragons dancing, is that those two fangs will wake up, and once they do, every fang in Glipwood will be looking for the three kids and a little black dog. Oh, and the girl has a lame leg. Now tell me, do you think they'll have a hard time finding us? Janner finished, more irritated than when he had begun. What do we do? Lily asked after a long pause. Mama will be at the cliffs watching the dragons, but that will probably be the first place the fangs will look for us. Poto always stays home on Dragon Day, so that's where we're going. Poto will know what to do. Janner set his face for the lane that led to the cottage. I hope he does. Here. Tink wrapped Lily's other arm around his neck and picked up his pace. Nugget trotted along beside them very seriously, as if he too had realized it was a bad situation. The light deepened as they hurried on, so that when they were still an arrow shot away from the cottage, they already knew that their grandfather wasn't home. No lantern burned in the window. No smoke lifted lazily out of the chimney. Janner stopped and Tink with him as they sat Lily down on the grass, each bending over to catch their breath. Where do you... Suppose he is, Tink said between gulps of air. Don't know, Janner said, pacing. Maybe he went to see the dragons this year. Tink was doubtful. But he never goes to the cliffs on Dragon Day, Lily said, puzzled. Why would he go this time? Well, why wouldn't he be here at the cottage? Tink asked. I think we should look for him at the cliffs. Then we might see the dragons after all. A glare from Janner cut him off. Janner looked east in the direction of the sea. Maybe Tink was right. Maybe, for some reason, Poto had decided to watch the dragons this year. Fine, he said, but we're taking the Glipper Trail. We can't risk the main road. There are probably fangs everywhere. The Glipper Trail's faster anyway. Tink moaned, but already Janner was helping Lily toward the trail. Footnote 1 the Glipper Trail had been there since before Poto was born. Poto's parents, Ed and Yamsa Helmer, had planned to take advantage of the cottage's nearness to the cliffs by doing their fishing from there. After carving out a path, Ed purchased a crate of fishing line from a merchant in Lammerdron, later to become Fort Lammerdron. Tied a hook to the line, placed a horrified worm on the hook, and lowered the string down into the dark sea of darkness. Just getting the hook down to the water took the better part of the morning, and, of course, Ed had no way of knowing from that great height whether or not the bait and hook were indeed submerged. Near dusk that evening, Ed felt a tug on his line and began hauling in his catch. Sometime after midnight, Ed finally reeled in a small glipper fish. Yamsa wasn't happy about being awakened by Ed's cry of victory, or that in the dead of night he cleaned, cooked, and ate his little fish. Ed decided the next day that for all the trouble he had gone through for that one fish, he may as well have caught several. 
So we purchased a spool of rope from the same merchant in Lammerdron, fastened it to a net, and once again spent all morning lowering the net into the sea. This time he fastened the line to a team of oxen and had them haul in the catch. By sundown the oxen were exhausted and the catch was only halfway up the face of the cliff. Ed tied off the rope and let it hang for the night. Early the next morning he set the oxen to work again. By noon, the net full of glippers, small sharks, pinchers, and a squid was pulled over the edge and onto the solid ground. Even Yamsa had to admit that it was a good catch, and they ate nothing but fish for the next three weeks. Fish and biscuits for breakfast, fish sandwiches for lunch, fried fish for dinner. They ate so many fish, in fact, that both Ed and Yamsa got sick, and they were never again able to eat fish without gagging. Ed never again fished from the cliffs but the path by which his oxen pulled the heavy net remains. An old walking path led through the trees behind the Igby cottage and wound precariously near the edge of the cliffs. In the deepening shadows, the children made their way through the trees. When they emerged, the view was terrible and vast. Shale and tough grass littered the rocky verge of the land. The horizon was silent and wide, and a salty wind sighed upward around their ankles and through their hair. The children stood without speaking, dizzy with the smallness they felt looking out over the dark sea of darkness. Janner looked to his right and could make out a precarious trail winding over stone and brush leading away to where the people would be watching the dragons. The glipper trail stayed mostly level on a narrow shelf, while the ground near the tree line rose steeply above them. Wiry shrubs and roots clutched the rock wall as if they too were afraid of falling. Janner, I can't do this, Tink said. He was standing with his back against the gray rock, eyes clenched shut. You have to, Janner said. The fangs that might find us on the road are more dangerous than this trail right now. You have to try, Tink. Using the nearby boulders for support, Lily hopped back to him and took his hand. Come on, she said. Tink jerked his hand away and forced a smile. I'm not really worried about me, you know, he said with sudden bravado. I just meant that uh, I don't think Lily should be out here. Oh, thank you, Lily said wryly. Tink sighed and peeled his fingers from the rock. He inched along behind Lily and Janner, careful to stay as far as possible from the edge. As the light faded, the trail rose and narrowed. Lily picked her way across, but Janner had to stop now and again for Tink to gather the courage to follow. Janner kept looking back to be sure that Lily was able to navigate the trail without her crutch. With Nugget at her side and all manner of roots and rocks to hold, she seemed more like she was taking a stroll through a park than edging along a perch above the dark sea. Finally, they topped the rise in the trail, and it widened out to a grassy slope. Janner and Lily tried not to laugh when Tink burst ahead of them and paced the safe ground. His shirt was drenched in sweat, and he was strutting like he had just won a race. Ahead and below them, Janner saw the glow of torches where the people were gathered to watch the dragons. We made it, Janner said. Tink, help me with Lily. As they scrambled down the slope toward the throng, the moon began its soft ascent. Then they heard the most achingly beautiful sound in all of Air We Are.